So, and then uh, coming back uh, again to the um, the flood of uh, COVID cases in hospitals. I mean, I think now there's more and more news coverage about this. Uh, this is from the Journal of Health Sciences, I think it is. Uh, even the sort of core London in place uh, ICU capacity is not being used right at the moment. I mean, some are more heavily utilized than others, but there's, there's spare capacity in the existing system. And that's before the overflow that has been built. And I think there's been a, a, a recent story of 19 beds being occupied in the 2000 bed a Nightingale Hospital. And I think, you know, we can argue forever about a lot of things, but it's clear there isn't the flood of cases that were predicted by this model. Um, and that's that's important that we just realize that it's not worked for that. And I think I'll go through a lot of other things that hasn't worked for. Right, this is um, this is where I think the actual the calculations went wrong. I think uh, the 160,000 is the right number of deaths in an unmitigated epidemic scenario. Now, in a way, it kind of doesn't matter. Well, it does and it doesn't. But the way I see, I could well be wrong on this, where the maths went wrong is that when the model was set up, they essentially took uh, some data from Wuhan and they used um, the infected, the, the ratio of people infected at a point in time. So you have your population, you test them for the disease with this PCR test, uh, and you say, okay, this many people are infected. Then a certain number of those unfortunately die and you end up with a ratio. The ratio was 1.3. Well, in the Diamond Princess case, it was 1.3. Uh, and then what's happened is that 1.3 has been applied to the cumulative number of people who have been through the sort of infection process. Uh, and those can be the ones that had no symptoms, that had the infection and were cured. So that's the sort of end point in time when everything's worked its way through the system. And then you end up with, according to Imperial College, 80%, or it's actually 81% of the population having been infected. And they took the 1.3 and times it by 80% of the population, and they ended up with their, uh, with some adjustments a little bit at the bottom there I won't go into. They ended up roughly with 500,000 people dying. And I'm saying those two metrics cannot be multiplied together. One is a point in time uh, snapshot. Do these people have uh, COVID-19 or not? Yes or no. The other one is have they ever had it now or at any time in the past and has that, you know, and, and those infections have been resolved, that's a different number. You can't multiply one, one by the other and come out with the right answer. Uh, and even if you could, okay, let's say even if you could come up with the right answer and you, come, and you have a, a different way of looking at this, which is through the people infected, the, um, the infection fatality ratio. If you, if you look at it another way through that lens, which I don't use, um, you have some more numbers coming out from the US right now. They think that because there are a lot more infections that we knew, than we knew about in the past to every case, they think that infection uh, fatality ratio is 0.2. Now, if you multiply 0.2 by 80% times the population, you end up back at about 100,000 uh, fatalities from this disease. So it's, it's basically 150,000, 100,000 versus 510. And I, I can't square the 510. So, and then the last thing is just looking at the model um, more or less uh, line by line, just to highlight where things have been pushed a little bit to to the edge. Um, the the worst case fatality actually is quite a lot lower uh, than than is than is considered under this SPI modeling summary, which is a sort of agreed upon rules for the UK. So uh, that's lower, but what's very much higher in the imperial model is 80% of people are infected of population at the end versus 50, which is the upper limit under these guidelines. So I'm, I'm not quite sure what status they have, but they're, they're quite detailed. Uh, they're available on the internet. But still, if you have the product of those two things, 250 and 50, 180 and 80, you end up with a much higher number for imperial than is considered uh, as, as the absolute boundary for this uh, reasonable worst case scenario calculation. So already you're very sort of high and you're off the scale under the SPI-M model. 
Um, and then you you basically okay the other assumptions they've a little bit pushed over the edge, but not not maybe too far. Case hospitalization is meant to be limited at four percent. They use four point four. Um, the requirement to go from a general sort of hospital into an intensive care unit, if existed, by the way, that's another interesting caveat they have in the SPI model. Is twenty five percent. They've used thirty percent. So. And I think the most amazing thing of all, to be honest, is um, the instructions in the SPI model tell you very, very clearly that there's really no evidence for, uh, specifically they mention these cancelling large public events. And I'll just read even this verbatim is benefits of even major reduction in travel are small. So that document, which was an agreed upon consensus document, is telling you that there's really there's certain common sense things you have to do, but beyond that, these um, more sort of drastic um, society level things do not have an impact. But then on the side of Imperial, those things are hugely impactful, and th they were I mean the, the the social distancing for the whole population is the cornerstone of their strategy. And in the modeling guidelines, there's absolutely no basis for assuming anything on, on, that act, on, on that policy. But in Imperial, not only are they assuming things, but they actually have very nice, neat mathematical links between, you know, if we do this kind of distancing, this is worth this much percent. Uh, some other action is another certain, certain kind of percent. And social distancing has a huge impact. And as far as I can see, there's absolutely the, the SPI modeling instructions tell you essentially not to do that. So I think this is the biggest uh, question. And I think uh, the Swedish uh, epidemiologist came out and I, the phrase uh, stuck with me where he said, there is not a shred of evidence to back that up. And it, it does seem to fit together that these are formula and numbers. Um, those formula and those numbers are not re related to anything. It's just in the, it's in sort of table 10 and page 15. There's no link to anything. There's no explanation. There's no evidence. There's no basis of evidence. It really, it's just buried in the spreadsheet and our whole policy and everything we're doing today is based on those calculations. And there's no visibility into where those things came from. And that's not a good place to be. So the final uh, piece for me here is what are the costs and benefits? Um, and it's not an eco economy versus non-economy argument. It's basically today a lives versus lives argument. And the lives saved uh, is zero for what we have right now because the whole premise was that ICUs are going to get flooded. Lots of people are going to die because they can't have treatment. So we all have to stay at home. The ICUs haven't been flooded. There's been capacity, so the the delta of everyone staying at home is absolutely zero. So we actually have achieved zero because the capacity was there for the demand that, that actually came about from COVID. Uh, now you have the sort of flip side, which is uh, even if my numbers are not right, where all of the incremental deaths are due to the policy of sort of closing parts of the NHS and then scaring people so much that they don't go in to the NHS for treatment. Those downsides are five, six, seven, eight. They're, they're growing every week uh, while this is going on. So that's a very significant number of deaths just from the knock on effect of the policy. Um, and again, compared to no gain, you know, there is no there's no incremental benefit from what we're doing right now. Then you get into all of this uh, Institute of Fiscal, Fiscal Studies numbers. I think we all know there's, I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of people, uh, you know, children born into recessions, mental health. They give, they give a number. I mean, you can pick a number. Uh, their number is 500,000 extra mental health problems uh, and 900,000 chronic health problems. And uh, you know, who's to say for sure? But those numbers don't look too crazy um, and and the scale of those numbers is absolutely staggering so um, just to sort of wrap up then I know it's a slightly winding road but um, uh, this is I think I've had a go at trying to explain 
how come there's so many COVID deaths in the Office of National Statistics data? A thousand, uh, in, on some days it was a thousand, but there's no pressure on the, um, uh, on the intensive care units. The answer being that those Office of National Statistics numbers don't actually mean really very much at all. And my calculation could be wrong if someone wants to do another one, is about 7% of those associated with or related to deaths are actual genuine deaths from COVID. So when you factor that in, that's why you don't have pressure on the ICUs. Uh, and then that sort of feeds in also into why why the UK deaths to case rate is 12% versus 2.5% for Germany. Again, people have been fishing for all kinds of answers that we're in an early stage of testing and we haven't got the right number of cases, but actually you need to look at the, um, you need to look at the numerator, not the denominator. The, the way we define deaths here is, is, is uh, it's bizarre. And uh, some other countries also defining death in that bizarre way. And a very interesting one was, I think, Italy in, in an offhand comment, uh, an assistant to the Minister of Health said, listen, only 12% of our COVID deaths actually are deaths from COVID. And that was an interesting comment in the FT, and it kind of fits very closely into uh, the numbers I've been looking at, basically. Uh, and then that will explain the third thing, which is why are the weekly death rates going up? Um, because of the impact of the policy and and the fear of people not going in for treatment and the, the, the all the treatments that are suspended i think i heard a number now on an interesting podcast the waiting list now for nhs has gone up to five million people and so, th so this is going to take uh incredible amount of work to deal with that kind of backlog and of course people in that backlog are, are going to die and uh, I think we have got this very badly wrong, basically. But I'm not an expert in this area, but I can see what the maths is telling me. Um, and the reason I explained all this, or tried to explain it, probably not very well, is that there, there are really genuinely experts out there who are uh, passing on a message uh, as epidemiologists, you know, look carefully at the death data, really ask questions about why is this lockdown making sense, um, and those those are really the people to listen to. But uh, before even understanding what they say, you have to get a slight handle on what do these numbers mean and, what, and what's the you know what's the background in all this because it, it's uh, it can be confusing some of this stuff. So I, that's um, that's what I try to do in this little video here. And then just at the end, essentially. So you know we are enormously exposed as a country to some very opaque calculations. Uh, they've not been released, they've not been peer reviewed. Um, and then when I listen to um, the uh, Common Select Committee, those assumptions are all over the place, uh, doubling, tripling, halving, divide by three. I, I was totally and utterly confused at the end of that. I, I just cannot believe you can run a big policy on such a flimsy basis. Uh, you know, everyone's in business, or well, not everyone, but a lot of people in business. You you have to have the numbers straight. You have to know what your assumptions are. You have to have a plan. You have to measure against the plan. But in the most important policy decisions we've made for a long time, there's nothing. It's just a sort of sponge. The, 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 the I can't hang my hat on a single number essentially, and that's uh, and that's very dangerous for what we've got ourselves into. I think one of the other things that really struck me as well is um, is a caveat in the work that says, you know, we are optimizing to prevent a um, excess demand on the intensive care units. And the caveat is we do not consider ethical or economic implications. And to me, that's an insane way to make any kind of policy recommendation where you make the policy recommendation irrespective of any other costs, associated costs, direct costs, impacts, anything. It's really crazy because just having that caveat in there means that inevitably you're going to solve to have a shutdown because it doesn't cover, it doesn't carry any associated costs for you. So if you don't want the ICU capacity to be overloaded, and but you don't consider the cost of your policy, your policy is always going to be to shut everything down. It, because it's costless for you, so it was a, it was an opt out right from the beginning to make recommendations without thinking about the enormous knock on effects, which I think 
all of us somehow intuitively understand are way out of proportion of anything we're getting. And we're actually not getting anything, basically, because the ICU capacity is not being flooded. And one thing uh, I'd say also about this whole process is when we are talking about COVID deaths and uh, sort of mitigation and, and, and those things, the only end game for achieving a result from this is to go all the way through to vaccine, which I didn't really understand this for, for quite a while. That if you, if you start this process and you do it for three months, six months, nine months, ten months, it's been a waste of time. You have to do it all the way through to vaccine. And then, you know, again, the numbers become important of what's your uh, unmitigated epidemic. If it's 160,000 people, that's unmitigated. You do some mitigation, you get that down to 80,000. You, you can lock the whole country up um, for, for, for 18 months, more or less, uh, to in some way save, I don't know, uh, some of those 80,000. So you've got to take from the 80,000 the number who will, will be infected, and then you're left with, the, I don't know how many you're left with, but then you, that, that's all that's going to benefit from the vaccine. And then you've got their life expectancy from there on in. It, it really, it, it's insane compared to the damage that's being done at the moment. So as a non-epidemiologist, I mean, I can look at the figures, the, the weekly death figures, I can, you know, I think we, anecdotally we can see what's going on. I look mainly at macroeconomic figures that I'm not even going to mention. Uh, this is, uh, it just doesn't make any sense. And I think worst of all, we were definitely on the right path. We we had a epidemic plan from the NHS, which was very, very sensible for a layman like me. Um, it was exactly based on Sweden's approach. Um, and last minute that was all thrown us, thrown away and we decided to do a completely new lockdown approach and in my experiences if you throw away reasonably well prepared and thought through plans and pursue something uh, on the hoof it generally doesn't go that well for you. So I think um, uh, I've tried to put together the work that I've done and sort of hint that there's quite a few numbers there in this that can explain uh, some of what's going on. There's plenty of uh, other angles to this story and I think one of the interesting angles for me is who was behind changing the Office of National Statistics approach to uh, essentially accounting for death by opening up this new number where it just has to be mentioned in the death certificate. That's never happened ever before, as far as I know. Uh, and it's quite an interesting thing to think, why did that happen? It happened quite early. You know, why was it done? It was also the change that allows doctors to diagnose COVID even without a swab. So uh, you can look at someone and without a swab, you can say that's a COVID-19 death. I, I find that also strange because Inevitably, you end up manufacturing very, very big numbers that uh, play into the narrative of a deadly disease that's killing us all. But you know, I think if we actually saw what the real numbers were, deaths from COVID in part one of the death certificate, the numbers would be quite disappointing. I mean, uh, disappointing and not in the sense of uh, we'd like to see them higher, but they will they will paint a picture that it's not the picture that we've been led to believe, that this is a deadly disease uh, that's going to kill potentially 500,000 people. I think if you see the actual deaths from COVID, if ONS ever disclosed that, it's not going to be very significant. And it's going to be a drop in the ocean compared to uh, five, six, seven, eight thousand people a week mainly dying because the system's been reconfigured and because they've been scared into staying at home. So I think uh, that's it for what it's worth. Um, I hope that adds some numbers because at the moment we're just having a lockdown, non-lockdown, and it's sort of who can shout the loudest. Uh, but here is some data that actually tells you that, you know, the side effects of the policy are very, very significant. And in a way that's to be expected because this policy was set up with an explicit uh, opt-out not to consider the impacts of the policy. So lo and behold, it was chosen and the the incidental impacts are very significant. And I think most normal people uh, think, look, let's protect the old people. Um, let's everyone else get on with our lives. And 
let's accept the fact that this virus exists and it's going to do what it's going to do. But that, that's not a reason to essentially um, create so much incidental destruction uh, on this country. And hopefully we can go back to what we always had was as a plan. And uh, that's my closing thought for the evening. Thank you.